We're only two weeks out from the 2018 midterms, and the campaign rhetoric is red hot. And in somewhat of a surprise, Donald Trump's approval rating is up. What does all that mean for Tuesday, November 6th? Let's talk about that with our political panel. They are Chris Liu, former White House Cabinet Secretary, former Deputy Secretary of Labor in the Obama administration. He's now senior fellow at the University of Virginia's Miller Center. He joins us from Washington. And with us here in studio is Joel Pollack, the senior editor at large and in-house counsel at Breitbart News. He's also the co-author of How Trump Won, The Inside Story of a Revolution. All right, Joel, Trump's ratings are up. Obama's ratings were about the same, and he lost 63 House seats in the midterms. Bill Clinton's ratings were at 48 percent. He lost 54 House seats in his midterms. What's your read on this one, Joel? I think there'll probably be some Republican losses, but I don't think they'll be as bad as either of those two cases. In both of those cases, the economy wasn't doing so well. Here, Trump has a very solid economy heading into the midterm elections. With Obama, also you had Obamacare, and that was a big unifying issue for Republicans. Democrats don't seem to have one unifying issue or message going into this midterm election. The media, which often amplifies Democratic messages, is still talking about Saudi Arabia. I'm not sure how many voters really care about what's going on in Saudi Arabia or Turkey. So I don't see Democrats having that unifying push. And so I think Republicans will be able to hold on to more seats. Chris, what do you see? You know, the president's approval rating certainly rose in the one poll that came out this weekend on NBC, uh, but he's still averaging around 42, 43 percent, which is historically low for a president. What I look at in the NBC poll was the, and other polls, is the persistent advantage that Democrats uh, have over Republicans, about a nine-point advantage right now, uh, as well as higher enthusiasm uh, among Democrats, particularly among women, young people, and Latinos. Uh, I think ultimately that's probably going to drive the election more than the president's approval ratings, uh, as well as where independents are. Whatever independents do is where the election's going to go. Joel, Chip O'Neill once famously said all campaigns, all elections are local. Yeah. Well, when you got 480 seats, aren't issues different in Colorado in a, in a congressional race than they are in Michigan in a congressional race? Is there a national issue? There are national issues for Republicans, and I think the economy is a big national issue. Trump's definitely put that on the ballot. The Brett Kavanaugh hearings have become a national issue. But you're right. These are all different races. That's what makes them so much fun to cover. Last week, I was traveling with a conservative Republican, Dana Rohrabacher, on a bus of senior citizens to a marijuana dispensary. He's very pro-marijuana conservative Republican in his district, Huntington Beach, in the beachfront communities of Orange County, that's very popular. You wouldn't find a Republican elsewhere running on a pro-marijuana stance. So, so how do you have a national picture, then? The national picture is partly about how President Trump's doing, and he has said that he's on the ballot, his policies are on the ballot. Uh, but there are things Republicans have done and stood for very strongly. The tax cuts, for example, Nancy Pelosi says she wants to reverse them. Republicans are promising more tax cuts. The border has become an issue. Again, in recent weeks, we have this caravan coming up from Honduras, and Trump is saying, if you want to build a wall, you've got to vote for Republicans. Democrats are saying, if you want comprehensive immigration reform, you want to find another way to solve this problem, you've got to vote for Democrats. So there are some national issues emerging through the media. But one of the things that makes these things so much fun to cover is how different each of these communities really is. A lot of fun. Chris, uh, Trump has been pushing a punchy new slogan. Democrats produce mobs. Republicans produce jobs. How do you counter that? It's pretty cute. Well, it is pretty cute, but I'm not sure the uh, facts actually bear that out. Uh, the President Obama actually created more jobs in his final 19 months in office than uh, President Trump has created in his first 19 months. What's interesting, though, is that the economy tells multiple stories. Yes, the top line economic numbers, low unemployment, are certainly good. But when you look at where most people are in this country, uh, whether it's in the middle class or lower middle class, they're not really feeling much of a benefit from tax cuts, which is one of the reasons why Republicans just haven't talked about that. And then you add on top of that the trillion-dollar deficits that we're now facing. And yes, the, the economy tells you one story, but there are many other stories. Uh, and let's just be honest, this idea that uh, Democrats are suddenly uh, behind mobs uh, just completely defies reason at this point, given the president's really harsh, violent rhetoric from some of his recent campaign appearances. Joel, when I was a kid, 
Republicans were very big on the environment and hated deficits. What changed? I think Republicans are still big on the environment. I think what's think? happened... Oh, yeah, for sure. I think that the EPA has gone beyond its, its boundaries. Uh, there are even liberal Democrats who agree with me on this. Uh, my former law school professor, Larry Tribe, was part of the opposition to the power plan that Obama put out there to, coal, to regulate coal, eventually put coal out of business, saying it was unconstitutional. I think there's been an overreach in the federal government on environmental issues. In terms of the deficits, I think the criticism of Republicans is 100 percent correct. I think, you know, as a conservative Republican myself, uh, I'm very concerned about the federal deficit. It just rose 17 percent. The tax cuts brought in record revenues, but we still haven't disciplined the spending. And I think that's going to be a big challenge going forward. Right now, it's not on voters' minds because the economy is doing so well. But I think that that's where Republicans have to say, hey, we haven't done this yet, and we need to do it in the next Congress or the next term. It's one of the problems as an issue, Chris. The deficit doesn't call you on the phone. <laughs> it, it, it's exactly right. And, and I think I'd agree with Joel that everyone likes tax cuts, everyone likes more spending. But at some point, this will catch up. I mean, as I said, we are at $1 trillion deficits per year. That's what we're approaching at this point. You'll go back to where President Clinton was in office, and we had unemployment at around 4 percent or so, where we are right now, and we were running surpluses at that time. The deficit will have a longer-term impact because it starts to crowd out other spending. And as you've started to see now, uh, uh, Leader McConnell has now said, well, you know, we're going to have to look at Social Security, Medicare, Medicaid. Uh, the president says, no, no, we're not going to do that. The numbers simply don't add up. Uh, and we're so we're going to face a reckoning uh, sometime in the very short term. Saudi Arabia going to be an issue, Joe? I don't think so. I don't think anybody can work out exactly what's going on there. And as bad as what Saudi Arabia did was, uh, Turkey is the worst country to be a journalist in. 2016, 2017, Turkey was the number one jailer of journalists in the world, according to the Committee to Protect Journalists. So it's very hard to figure out who are the good guys. And the pro-Saudi policy that this administration has is consistent with the previous administrations, Obama, Clinton, the Bushes. So there's not much there, I think, to hang a hat on politically. I just want to go back to something uh, Mr. Lewis said about the mobs phenomenon. Uh, you've seen harsh political rhetoric on both sides, but I think to a lot of Republican voters, to a lot of Trump voters, there's an element of it now that feels personally threatening in a way that people didn't feel before. You have the Maxine Waters is saying to people, you got to confront these Trump administration officials in the restaurants, in the places they live, and that sort of thing. There are people experiencing that every day, not administration officials, not elected representatives, but there are people who feel a sense of fear because of the way that Trump supporters have been demonized. And so I think that resonated. When people see these images of left-wing protesters banging on the doors of the Supreme Court shouting, shut it down, shut it down, I think that frightens people about where we've come. So I think uh, we could certainly blame both sides, and you could say that President Trump has said some pretty strident things. But I think the phenomenon of left-wing organizing in this way to create peer pressure almost not to support Trump, I think, has, has concerned a lot of conservative voters. Chris, you want to respond? Yeah. I, I, not surprisingly, I will adamantly disagree with that. You know, when you've got the president of the United States doing a rally in Montana where he is applauding a congressman who assaulted a journalist, at the exact same time that a journalist has been killed in Saudi Arabia. Uh, that shows you where we are in this country, not only in terms of rhetoric, but in terms of standing up for American values. For every incident of uh, uh, progressives out there marching, I can come up with as many examples of conservatives marching. Let's simply point back to Charlottesville uh, and the rise of the far right uh, and what that does to minority communities. And I could say that as a, a person of color, how that affects me. But I think what we can all agree on is that incivility has risen in this country. The rhetoric has gotten out of hand, and the president bears some blame for that. Uh, if he simply ratcheted this down, uh, I think this would have a calming influence around the country. We are more, uh, we are more divided than we have ever been, and that's very troubling in this country right now. But why does Hillary Clinton get to say things like, the time for civility is over? If we win, we can be civil again, but until then, we shouldn't be civil. I mean. I, I see that on the Democratic side, and I think that that's coming home to people in their neighborhoods, at their schools. I mean, I've, I've been accosted by people dropping my kid off at school. I think what Trump does, and some of it is very objectionable, is targeted against media people, personalities and politics, celebrities. What 
Republicans are feeling in their neighborhoods is that they're being personally targeted as ordinary people, as voters, and I think that's what's frightening. Uh, what, uh, Joe, give me your fear. What's your worst fear if the Democrats take the House? I think things will shut down completely. I think that Pelosi is under a lot of pressure to pursue impeachment, even though she's tried to tamp down talk about that. Tom Steyer, who was the single biggest donor in the 2014 cycle, the last midterms, he's all in for impeachment. A lot of these candidates want to impeach the president. So I think pursuing impeachment, pursuing a lot of these investigations, you know, some of the investigations you could say are legitimate. We've got to look into uh, some of the conflicts of interest that have come out in the Trump administration, which I think is totally fair and legitimate. That should be looked into. But some of them are just ridiculous. I mean, there's an it attempt to paralyze the administration. It would be a show, but it wouldn't succeed in the Senate, so it would go the way the others right. have gone. Right. And I think it would be divisive. And, and I, look, the last, the last time Nancy Pelosi was in charge of the House uh, before a presidential election, so you go back to her first term as Speaker, 2007, 2008. Congress didn't do anything, and all it really was doing was setting up for the presidential race. So that's going to happen regardless, but I think this particular agenda that Democrats have brought, where we're looking at maybe over a hundred investigations, I think most of which are either without merit or don't really yield very much, I, th I think it's just going to be an attempt to paralyze the Trump administration for the sake of doing so. So that, Chris, that's, I think, bad for Chris, me. what's your fear if the Republicans keep the House? Well, I think if a Republican keeps the House, we're going to continue on the path we're continuing, where this incivility, this sharp rhetoric, these divisive policies are going to be taken to a whole new level. Uh, it's not clear that Republicans can govern either, other than the Supreme Court nominations and other judicial nominations. They haven't achieved much from a legislative perspective, tax cuts being one of them, but I could have written a much better tax cut bill on a bipartisan basis. I am encouraged that if Democrats take over, they're not going to pursue impeachment. This is something the right wants to push as a way to motivate their voters. The Democrats are not going to impeach uh, Donald Trump, but what they're going to do is focus on sensible policies that appeal to the middle class and where there is compromise possible, whether that is immigration, whether that's sensible gun control policies, whether that's infrastructure. These are areas where the president has indicated a willingness to work with Democrats, and, and there is a middle ground there. Let's not forget, the last two times that the U.S. Senate passed immigration reform, on a bipartisan basis, it's stalled in the Republican uh, House of Representatives. There is real need for immigration policy, and that can happen on a bipartisan basis. I think we'll have you both back sometime within the next two weeks. Thank you both very much. <laughs> Absolutely.